Hello and welcome to the conversation, The Quest for Ethical Banking. We are delighted to introduce David Kustan from Triodos Bank, Giles Cuthbert from the Chartered Bank Bankers Institute, Safta Sawa from the Islamic Finance Council, and Beth Stratford from Friends of the Air Scotland to explore how we can redefine ba banking systems to serve community, environment, and economy. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I'm just going to spend uh, a few minutes sort of framing the discussion um, for today. Um, we've been asked to look at how we can redefine the banking sector so it serves community, economy, and the environment. And I think it's worth just reflecting on why the banking sector is so important, why it has such an important influence over our community, environment, and economy. Uh, what makes it different from other sectors? Um, and I think it's sort of twofold, really. Banks are not just companies selling goods and services like other uh, sectors of the economy. They're actually the operating system of the economy. So if they fail, then that's our means of making payments wiped out. And that's actually our money supply more or less wiped out as well, except for the coins and notes in circulation. So that's kind of a, a major reason why, what, which makes the banking sector unique. And I think the second thing which is not so widely understood by the public is that banks actually have control over the supply and allocation of money. Um, I just, um, I'd be interested before we embark on this discussion to just take a straw poll to ha so that we have a sense of how many people were aware that banks play that role in the economy, that banks have the power to create money. Can you just put your hand up if you already were aware that banks had the power to create money? That's, that's a pretty fantastically high proportion compared to the rest of the, the wider public and politicians and economists. So uh, you can already give yourself a pat on the back for that. So, uh, um, <laughs> Few. We don't have to go into that very technical um, detail of how that works. But um, so obviously, given that role in the economy, they have enormous power over the health and the direction of the, co the economy. They decide how much money is created, who gets it, and to what use it's put. So, with that sort of framing introduction, I thought it would be um, well, I mean, I thought it would be interesting just to recap on how the banks have been in the news recently. They're in there a lot, up in the headlines for all the wrong reasons. We've had RBS's payment system completely breaking down so that customers in Ireland couldn't actually access their accounts for a month. We've had, obviously, the LIBOR scandal where it emerged that um, banks like Barclay, Barclays had been rigging the crucial interbank lending rate, which determines, uh, you know, upon which is based about $500 trillion worth of uh, financial instruments and loans and mortgages. We've had HSBC uh, in trouble for laundering uh, billions of dollars for drugs cartels and terrorists. We've had the fraudulent selling of PPI. We've had dodgy derivatives being sold. We've had uh, the RBS lending 40 billion pounds of, of money to fossil fuel companies, even though they're owned by 82%, 82% uh, owned by the taxpayer. Um, and of course, they're constantly um, in trouble for not lending enough to small businesses, which provide two thirds of our jobs. So, I mean, that's the status quo. That's where we're at. Um, and so what I want to do now is just ask each of our panelists to, rather than get stuck in the nitty gritty of how we get from here to our ethical banking system of the future, just to maybe give us a bit of an outline of what an ethical banking sector that was really serving community, environment, and economy would be doing differently in the future. How would it look? Should we start with David? Do you want to go first? Okay. Yeah? Okay. Um, well, yeah, my, my name's uh, David Cowson. I work for Treadoff's uh, Bank. Um, so the, the question was, is, is there such a thing as ethical banking? Well, I would say yes uh, to that. I mean, it, it, um, it's very small, but it is a growing sector, I think. Um, uh, I've been with the bank um, for 14 years, uh, 
eight of those, uh, six of those in, in Bristol and uh, eight up here in, in Scotland. The bank was founded on principles of, uh, in 1980, 30 years ago, on the basis of using savings to lend to projects that delivered social or environmental value. Uh, and that is what it does uh, today. When I joined the bank, there were 20 in, in the UK, and that now, now there's 100, and there's 720 across the five European branches that the bank has with its head office in Holland. So it's independent, and its shares are held in a trust. Um, and we've seen a, a growth in what the bank does. But um, uh, it uses real money, savers money, to lend to projects that have that social and environmental uh, value. And uh, we also work uh, internationally uh, with microfinance funds supporting institutions uh, um, in developing countries uh, as well. But the key thing is that there's a social environmental uh, benefit in, in what we do. We're also a member of the Global Alliance for Banking Values, which was established in the last two or three years, which is a group of 20 international uh, banks that have come together uh, to deliver sustainable development. Um, so does it work? Well, our, what we're finding now is that there has been a, a huge interest or growth in, uh, in the interest in what the bank does, and our lending increased by 36% last year. Um, so uh, I think people are thinking now about how uh, money can be used positively. So what an ethical bank would mean to me, or the term ethical, uh, and that's a different thing to different people, it might be called a social bank or an environmental bank, but it's firstly to use money for, for a social purpose. And it's using real uh, money. It's money from our savers that can be linked to activity that is sustainable and delivering uh, social and environmental benefit. Transparency is, to me, an important part of being ethical, is to share with your savers where that money is being used and to list all the projects that, that we support, uh, which we do. So we're accountable uh, for the money that we're lending. I think also, uh, Regulating bonuses is an area uh, as well where, um, you know, there could be change and that to me is, is part of, of, of being ethical. Um, I'd maybe just stop there. Uh, I've probably said uh, enough for, for, for now. Thanks, okay. David. Giles, do you want to? Yeah. Hi, I'm Giles Cuthbert. I'm uh, Managing Director of the uh, Chartered Banker Institute, which is the professional body for bankers in the UK. Um, so it's not a trade body that represents the banks. It is uh, representing individual bankers. And I think as a starting point, I would like to say, uh, do, you know, we have all this talk of bankers and do spare a thought for the average banker who has maybe worked for 30 years, taken all their exams. Um, they've met all the sort of objectives they set for themselves. They went into banking because they thought it was a good thing to do to improve the community. And they suddenly find themselves without a job, without a bank, without any savings because of what's happening. So I think it's important to be empathetic here and remember that an awful lot of bankers have been affected by this in the same way that the community at large. But getting on from that point, um, as a professional body, what we have really since 1875 been seeking to do is to instill professionalism into the banking sector. My perspective on how we can get ethical banking in the future is that any system is only as good as the people working in it. If they do not work to sound personal ethical principles and have sound uh, ideals around the virtues they wish to aspire to, we cannot have the ideal of an ethical banking system. 
To that end, we introduced ethics and professionalism into banking education a number of years ago now, but very few people take banking qualifications or exams. As you'll know from uh, the, the uh, Treasury Select Committee, none of the chief executives of the major banks were indeed qualified. And this applies even in what we would describe as ethical banks and microfinance organizations. If people aren't qualified, don't understand what they're trying to do, how can people make well-informed ethical decisions? Um, I would draw a similarity with bouncers. At any nightclub in the UK, a bouncer has to be you know, educated in what they do and amazingly has to have passed an exam. That doesn't apply to any bankers. So with no standards of practice, one thing we have done recently is set up a professional standards board to start to try to define what is the right way to run a business, what is wrong, because it's very difficult. It's, if you're a doctor, there's endless text how you, should, how you should operate your business, what's right, what's wrong, how do things sit ethically, there's an ethics committee to refer to. That doesn't exist in the framework we work in. And I think arguably, you know, we've never seen a better time for change. And we do need to grasp all that, that opportunity. So I do think that it's this personal professionalism that for me is the key. Doesn't matter what system you've got, if you don't have those professional values in place, um, you do, you know, get things going wrong. And, and let's not forget, people don't go into banking to do bad things. Um, but there's also this acceptance that somehow by osmosis they will understand how to operate a huge company, they'll understand how to take the right lending decision, they'll somehow magically understand um, what is a good lending decision vis-a-vis -vis what is a bad lending decision. So there's a whole framework I think that's missing at present to allow us to move in this ethical direction and indeed one major part of that is remuneration packages which do drive wrong behaviors. I even think, David, it was quite interesting what you said there about lending increasing by 30% as a measure of success. Mm. I wouldn't necessarily see increasing lending as a measure of success. Mm. HBOS did a fantastic job of increasing mortgage lending. Um, it didn't end well. But just to round off quickly, we're only a very small part of the solution. We need banks like Triodos that are moving in the right direction, and we need different solutions. We need microfinance organizations. We need government to help this happen. Overall, I think capitalism needs to have a good long look at where it's heading and needs to perhaps return to some of its grassroots of how businesses should operate. But most of all, I'd ask people here and as a society, do we really want this change? Do we consistently reinforce the norms of current banking behavior? And I would say, yes, we do, absolutely. There's, be, there's a money for nothing generation where people have said, yes, I do want early retirement, even if that's going to destroy the pension fund over the next few years. Yes, I will buy my council house, even if that's going to lead to a lack of public housing for the homeless. Um, yes, I will vote for demutualization, even though that may well destroy the organization and lead to its collapse. No, I won't bother changing banks to send a clear message to the banks that have failed that maybe it's a good time to change. Um, and will I pay for my banking? Because that's what it gets down to. If we don't pay for the banking, the money has to be made somewhere. And currently, it's being made in what's referred to as the casino banking operations. Most ethical banking models don't touch retail banking because it's very expensive to run and you don't see retail ethical banks setting up because they can't afford it, um, because people won't make that sort of commitment. So in short, for me, it's down to individual behaviors have to change. Professionalism and ethics has to come to the fore again. Looking at the number of qualified bankers in the UK, you've probably got about 15, 20,000 out of a total population of working in the banks of several hundreds of thousands. Can we expect any better than what we've got? No, and so we need to change those values. Thanks very much, Giles. Um, <laughs> Safta, go on. Okay, go thanks. It. Thank you, Beth. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Safta Sarwar. I'm speaking, uh, hopefully, with two, two, two kind of hats on. 
um, speaking on behalf of the Islamic Finance Council, and I'll touch on that um, just in a few minutes. As well as that, I've got 15 odd years experience in finance banking. I left uh, a, a very reputable bank uh, roughly three years ago to set up my own investment business. And not, not because I was disillusioned with the, the bank itself, but primarily to do something else. So I've got quite a lot of experience, therefore, from the from the banking perspective, investment perspective, as well as from my own. And I'm speaking now from, I'm speaking about a very, very small part of global finance. We talked here um, earlier about numbers of trillions and, and billions, and soon you get lost in, in such numbers and magnitude. But as, as we all agree, banking is instrumental in everything we do in terms of you know how we run our lives and uh, demonstrated by the fact that the Labour government was so clear in, in putting you know, taxpayers' money in during the, the, the credit crisis. And, and even now, there's this conversation about RPS being um, fully nationalised due to the, the, the credit issues and the lack of lending. But I'm going to talk about an element of ethical banking or ethical finance that's been around for, for a number of years, but it's only recently taken hold uh, globally in finance, and that's Islamic finance. And that's to do with faith-based banking or faith-based finance, where, where, where Islam as a religion, if I go back to actually religion, Islam as a religion, I mean, I'm, I'm a Muslim myself, um, you know, Islam as we well know, uh, Muslims are, are, are substantial religious based globally. Islam as a religion, you're meant to pray, we're meant to you know, do good within ourselves, within our communities. But as well as that, the religion teaches us we're also meant to run our business life, our financial affairs around very clear ethical criteria. Um, and due to those principles that are laid down very strictly over the last 20 years, or over the last 30 years or so, um, that's grown into what's been termed globally Islamic finance or ethical based finance according to the Muslim faith. And what does that mean in, in basic terms? It means three or four key criteria. Firstly, the, the lack of, and this is very important, the lack of excessive interest. Um, one can argue what we've seen over the last 20, 30 years um, in the debt bubble that we've seen, and then the subsequent crisis has been due to debt, debt basically, and people taking on too much debt, banks lending too much, and people then being over optimistic as a result, and that um, continues. But in Islam, debt is seen as pretty, pretty bad especially use of excessive interest, paying or receiving of interest. Because in Islam, or Islamic finance, money, money we talk about banks um, 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 creating money, but money has no real value. Money um, is it, just paper at the end of the day that's printed by, by the banks or, and, and directed by the central banks. It's got no real value as such. So, and we've seen some of that with the, the quantitative easing programs that we hear about every you know, six months or so, you know, led by the Bank of England, when suddenly 250 billion pops up, and you think, you know, where does this money come from? So, so interest is seen as a big no-no, as, as in, 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 in an excessive interest. So that, that curtails a lot of the, the speculation that we have seen in the conventional banks. Also in, in, in Islamic finance or Islamic banking, there's also an ethical element to it that's driven it where, where it, within Islam, you're, you're meant to, to do good. You're meant to um, not be very moral in your, in your outlook and in your life. So things like alcohol, tobacco, defense, um, entertainment companies are, are often a strict no-no in terms of investing in or partaking in. And going back to the point about um, interest and, and, and debt, within ethical and Islamic finance, there's also an issue around um, if you're going to be lending money or if you're going to be investing in something, you're meant to be doing it according to a partnership type structure. So the bank actually is taking on risk as well. Because right now when the bank is, is uh, lending you money, it's got very, apart from the fact it takes on ownership of a security over some, some assets, it's taken very little risk. So it's very much a joint venture shared relationship within um, Islamic finance and very much asset backed. If you're going to be lending something, at least know what you're lending to. You know, have some physical issue, issue there or, or, or asset there that you're actually lending to, you can actually see, touch, or have rights over, rather than, again, what we saw during the, 
um, three or four years ago where a lot of the banks were, were creating all these credit default swaps or options or derivatives and, and overlaying them with other derivatives and it's just mounting up and A, the bankers didn't understand them and now we know the CEOs who are getting paid millions didn't understand them. Um, so Islamic finance, growing industry, um, roughly about a trillion dollars in, in size globally, um, which is very, very small. It's roughly about 1% of the global finance industry, so very, very small. Um, and it's interesting, the growth of that has continued throughout the credit crisis, primarily because of the, the, the opportunities that we've seen in the Gulf, you know, how high oil prices, high gas prices have delivered that. Um, to give you a, a real-life example, um, a lot of you have probably seen, seen recently the Shard development that, that took place in London, in the city of London. Um, it's a very tall, tall building. I think one of the tallest buildings in Europe in London. That was financed Islamically by the Gulf banks for that development. Um, um, and we're seeing some of the principles of Islamic finance reaching into other, other faiths as well. I was reading the FT just two weeks ago. Uh, JP Morgan launched that Catholic-based investment fund, um, albeit that's not had um, a lot of assets. So some of the principles of Islamic finance, Islamic investing is, is taking place there. So whilst the debate around ethical banking is, uh, is wide-ranging, and I, I agree we need to have this debate, I, I do wonder sometimes whether we're having it you know, a bit too late once the, the, the horse has bolted, so to speak. But certainly Islamic finance and some of the principles of Islamic banking resonate across all faiths, all forms of banking, and it's certainly worth exploring in that respect. Thanks, Seftar. Well, um, there's, there's already like a number, a kind of, that, that's a, there's a broad spectrum of opinion there. And we've kind of got, we've had, uh, you know, focus from, from David on, uh, um, on, on sort of positive examples. You know, there are banks that are sort of taking you know, their responsibility really seriously. And, th and I think what Trudus does is absolutely amazing, especially if, as you say, they're really focusing on using existing savers' money uh, and investing it. Um, and, um, and I thought it was interesting what you said, Giles, about, um, about uh, banks only being as good as the people that work in them. And I think, you know, I think, I think that's true, but I wonder if we could sort of explore a little bit more how the, the structure and the, the, or the, the culture and the motivations that come to, to exist in banks are affected by the size and by the structure of those banks. Um, because, I mean, we, the, the, the UK banking sector is, is quite anomalous. I don't know if people realize this, but we have in the UK you know, 90% of, of personal banking accounts are with five banks. And that is really unusual compared to other countries. So, for example, Germany, 70% of uh, personal bank accounts are with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands, in fact, small, locally headquartered, cooperative banks or state-owned but locally managed banks. And that's a very different system, and I think it fosters very different... Um, sort of priorities for the people running those banks. Um, perhaps, um, for example, with credit unions and mutuals where they're owned, where they're owned by a, a, a broader um, variety of stakeholders that might, uh, well, the argument goes, that that, that fosters a, a, a more of a long-term um, sort of perspective than banks which are owned entirely by short, the, sort of shareholders who are thinking about the next quarter's returns. And so I wonder if any of you have, have thoughts about that, uh, about, about the structure and the diversity within our banking sector and, and, and how, um, what could be done really there to, to change things. Does anybody want to? Well, I mean, my, my view certainly is that structurally there's a significant problem. Um, the, the sheer scale, if, if, if you look at what happened in HSBC recently, or a number of the other uh, cases, there are claims made from the top that these parts of the organization that get involved with this are just so distant um, from the headquarters that 
nothing can be done. And, and, and that is a clear message that your organization has become too big mm. um, if you don't know what's happening in, uh, in, in every, every part of it. I would say that you know there have been problems with uh, German banks as well, even the uh, small the regional banks. So uh, Germany isn't necessarily the uh, the grail we seek. Um, but yeah, I mean it, it goes without saying that uh, any degree of competition um, would would help. I think certainly the 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 now very trendy discussion about separating the investment bank from the retail bank. Um, is, uh, is something which you know, we are heading towards and which I would broadly agree with. But it gets back to my point that we have this expectation that we will get free retail banking. And retail banking costs a fortune to run. Uh, every cash machine costs a fortune. Um, you know, in, in reality, you know, they can afford to do that because they are shipping out this money, some would say gambling with it. Um, but in reality, something needs to happen to pay for that retail banking and the expectation of the public that it will be free, I would argue it has an impact on what they end up getting. We get the banks we deserve because we are not prepared to really have a, an equal relationship with them. I mean, that's, that's very interesting because it, 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 it's one of the reasons why smaller banks and, and credit unions and new entrants to the market find it so hard to break in because they can't subsidize their current accounts with marketing and selling products at customers, you know, as the bigger banks do. And that I have definitely heard proposals that we should actually ban free current accounts mm. so that we put... Um, smaller banks on a level playing field with the big banks. But most of that cross-selling doesn't pay the bills either. In reality, in reality, for a lot of the banks, it is the investment bank that right. is allowing the retail bank to function. Mm. Cross-selling has never been quite the hit it should be. Most reasonably savvy customers have their mortgage in one place, their savings in one place, and actually have their retail banking somewhere where they're paying pretty much nothing. Mm. Um, so it is, it, it's a, it's a, it's a totally interdependent relationship at present. But of course it's got downsides as well. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I, I think, I mean, it might be interesting to talk a little bit about, about that, you know, about the, the way in which, um, because the banks know that they will be bailed out, they have to be bailed out, we couldn't possibly let the payment system crash overnight and disappear overnight. And that is another thing, I think, that gives an enormous advantage to the big banks. I mean, it's a, I don't know if any of you have you, seen the report that Neff did, which uh, the New Economics Foundation did a report which looked at the implicit subsidies that the state gives to the big banks because, um, because lend, well, banks have to borrow money as well. And if, if the lenders to banks know that that bank is going to be bailed out, whatever happens, by taxpayers' money, then they get lower interest rates, you see. So, um, and that's another reason, you know, why, why the smaller banks can't break into the market. So, I mean... But, uh, but I on. think there are a growing number of smaller banks, you know, Triodos, but there are others. You mentioned the credit unions. There are others in the sector that I seeing, uh, are seeing a growth in what they do. But I, I think w what connects them is that they've got a better understanding of, of, of their customer. Uh, and it's a real personal relationship. Uh, and that's what I feel, I mean, I, I can just talk with where I'm working, but there is that personal relationship. It's understanding your customer, visiting them, understanding the, the vision that they have and to be a financial partner. Um, so just picking up that point about lending increasing by 36 percent actually we see that as a good thing because to do that our savers need to be saving with us and the lending that the increased lending that we're doing it is for social or environmental impact so it could be fair trade or renewable energy or social housing or arts project so i think we see that as a very positive thing um uh, but, um, yeah, it's, I, I think the smaller banks are there as a catalyst uh, for, for, for change. But we need more competition within the sector.
and to encourage that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that there's been half a million people shift in the last six months, well, right. since January, I think, okay. out of the big banks and into the ethical smaller, smaller, smaller um, and co-op banks. Mm. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting, like you're saying, people are starting to vote with their feet, but it's, uh, they're kind of doing that against, in some senses, against their better, better interests. Which is, you know, because because it's 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 yeah the level the, the playing field is by no means level. Um, so I mean, I, I, I think it's I think it's really interesting that you know the, the Islamic model um, has this risk sharing um, this risk sharing element this this sort of assumption or, or um, acknowledgement that the risk if if if, that if you if you're trying to make money out of money. Well, I'm, I know that's not necessarily the the the, uh, the motivation um, for for Islamic yeah. lenders, but you know if you are trying to make money out of money, then it's only right that you take on some of that risk. Um, so uh, can you can you explain a little bit more about um, the the interest side of things? So is it that interest is entirely banned um, in Islamic finance, or or that it how does it work? Yeah, I mean, interest, as I said, is excessive interest. So interest where one, one has to um, pay, you know, you know, 10, 15, 20 percent. Often we see in some of these borrowings that um, um, borrowers have to, to pay is, is inappropriate. Is, is it's taking advantage of the, the, the borrower in some respects. So, so you know, interest based on reasonable rates is fine. In Islamic finance, the real the real guidance says, look, try not to if you got if you need capital, but try not to go down the the, the borrowing route per se. Try and get into a joint venture, mm. be it with an investment company, even with your bank, mm. um, or with some other entity. So you can actually share the risk. You you share the rewards as well. Um, it's very much in, in that um, sense. Um, as I said, it's a very small part of finance, but certainly something. Um, Growing. Going back to your point, if I may, um, Beth, earlier about um, the banking model globally, I think it's absolutely clear in my view that there's two things uh, that, that are wrong, and they have been for years. Firstly, is that the short term earnings that we see, you know, bank share prices are, are, are go move up and down based on their quarterly earnings reports. And that's not just true of banks, that's true of most public companies and most share price movements. And I think that affects fund management companies and the way they invest for your pension funds as well as uh, um, other investment decisions. I think that needs to change. And I, I know that Professor K, John K has done some good work in that respect in trying to get, get out of the short termism. But I think the key issue, in my view, why, why um, we've had a lot of these behaviours in the banks is compensation, frankly. Where, where the banker, and I'm talking here from the investment banking perspective as well as some of the private banking, who a lot of the compensation, a good percentage, could be as much as low as 20%, as high as 100% of their income is, is based on remuneration at the end of the year, based on various subjective judgments. Often, 90% of it is due to how much revenue is generated by that, that, that person. And, uh, and that just breeds um, short-term behaviours. That just breeds mis-selling. I'm not surprised that the PPI, I will not be surprised next year, the year after, other, uh, as we speak now in, in the middle of 2012, there's no doubt mis-selling going on. And that just breeds um, very short-term behaviours, which manifests itself throughout the, 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 the chain of think. The banks uh, and the government's doing some work in trying to curtail that. But whether they're doing enough, I'm not too sure. Um, I still worry that every February we see the, the CEOs of the banks getting substantial bonuses. And uh, I used to of, often used to wonder, you know, why you know, individuals that are very well educated, you, you know, in, in, in the normal universe, were still entitled to so much money relative to their peers in my view, and I met some of these pretty closely, they weren't doing that substantially um, great uh, a job. I mean, uh, and I, I'll leave you with an anecdote in this conversation just now. One of my friends used to say to me, and he, again, he was worked in finance, to really get high up in banking, 
it's not about how clever you are or how, how great you are at business. It's all about politics. And I kind of believe that now in some respects where the most politically savvy in terms of client relationships, in terms of internal works, uh, you know, get up the chain and they deem um, and get the substantial rewards that we've seen in the press. I mean, I think what you said there about um, the, the, the you, 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 know, you know, bankers' behavior being driven by the prospects for remuneration um, and, and, and the sort of aggressive targets that, 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 that they're, they're set is really, is really key for me. I mean, I don't know what the rest of you think, but, you know, if you look at in the sort of 10 years leading up to the crash, for example, what were banks lending to? They doubled the money supply, you know, in less than a decade. They doubled the money supply by, by lending so much. And only 8% of that went to the productive sector, went to manufacturing, agriculture, re the real economy. The rest of it was create new money created for speculation or for mortgages, which is why we had the house prices increasing so much. And I think part of that was, was to do with um, the fact that the risk surround f f for banks uh, around lending to, to real businesses is much higher, actually, than it is for lending for mortgages, um, where if the loan goes bad, they get the house at the end of the day. Um, I don't know what you guys think that we could do about, about that. I mean, given that changing the structure and diversity of the banking sector is going to take time. For new entrants to come in, offer, you know, specializing in, and focus on regional areas, etc., that's going to take time. Is there something that we could do, that the government could do in, in the shorter term, to try and ensure that banks take their responsibility more seriously to, to lend to, you know, the kind of things that Triodos lends to, <laughs> essentially? Mm. Um, what do you think about that? Anybody? Well, I think I'd, I'd have to disagree with your point that uh, lending on property is low risk. Um, and indeed the point that sharing more risk would be a good thing for Britain's banks because in terms of risk profile and looking at Ireland and risks taken on profit, property, uh, it's been anything but low risk. Yes, you've got a house, but a house worth virtually zero of which you've, uh, you've maybe got a security over and you've lent £400,000 on mm. is, not, uh, is not low risk by any means. And I think we've got to a, a conundrum point, frankly, where uh, banks have been encouraged to lend less to build up their balance sheets and therefore are in a, in a low-risk environment. I would say this applies, to, frankly, to people seeking mortgages at the current time as well as businesses. I think a lot of this gets into some of the credit scoring mechanisms uh, that are in place because, again, this gets into the individual professional decision of a banker, an individual can, I would argue, and it would be interesting to hear David's view on this, have quite a clear insight into the sort of people who are running an organization, uh, the sort of uh, you know, mission they have, uh, the ideals they're working to. Uh, you know, there's an awful lot that can't be delivered by a computer and simply feeding in the accounts of an organization. And so I do think um, credit scoring, particularly in the business environment, has a large part to, do, to play with this. Um, and uh, I think and that's where, again, I would say it gets into the personal professionalism of the banker and the banker being able to understand better um, the, the viability of a business in a way that we have this often very non-professional version of banking which does not allow for that personal input to allow to see um, you know, just how viable, how positive that business is for the community, what role it does play in the community. Actually, if that business in this corner goes down, there could be a, an area where you're seeing it's going to affect some of your other businesses negatively as well that you're working with, and you may, uh, your, your decision may be, may be altered. Um, you know, there's a whole aspect in there about how to approach a lending proposition professionally, which I think has been lost within mm. what I would describe as the digitization of the lending proposition. Um, I mean, I, I would just say that <laughs> actually that, that we don't credit score and, and never have uh, credit score exactly for that reason. I suppose we're sort of traditional bankers in that way. It's knowing your customer, understanding 
you know, what their, their vision is and seeing how you can, you can work with them. But I suppose a number of our customers are maybe customers that have gone to their high street bank and have had a negative credit score and can be quite frustrating, I think, for some of the, the, the high street bankers, as you say, that they're, the computer says that they can't lend. <laughs> computer says no. <laughs> yeah, the computer says no. So, I, yeah. So, can I just pick a point on lending? I mean, we, we, we talk a lot about we need to increase lending and uh, kickstart the economy via the banks, but you've got to remember as well, um, we've been through a massive credit bubble um, over the last 20, 30 years, certainly over the last 20 years. A lot of, a lot of it, some, not all of it, but some, a lot of it driven by, by policy makers, politicians. I mean, we, we remember well, after 9-11, um, Alan Greenspan, who was seen the US federal chairman, who was then lauded as the maestro, um, lowering interest rates, increasing money supply, which then um, manifested itself in what happened in, with, with, with UK um, Treasury policy making through Gordon Brown, etc. Invariably, once you have this credit bubble which burst over the last three, four years, invariably you, you get the swing the other way where you have a lack of credit. And it doesn't surprise me that, that the banks aren't lending now. After all, they've been told to cut back the risk. Um, they've been told to curtail what they're doing. We're in a, we're in a um, flat economy at best, recession at worst. Um, so, so I think often there's no actually real solution, you know, in seeking, you know, a solution. I, but, I, but this is the problem inherently mm. with having mm. a money supply that yeah. is based on bank debt because mm. it will contract. Once people start paying off their debts, the money disappears. If banks feel, don't feel confident to increase lending again, you have a contracted money supply and you have a recession. And that's, I mean, that's a bigger question. Do we reform the entire monetary system? Um, I, I think we, I, we really were a bit late in, in opening questions to the floor. So I think if um, we might stack up three questions from the floor and then ask the, the panelists to, to respond to, to any of them. Do you want to go first? is in relation to the people who live on the earth. After all, you know, the, the base that we have to live on is getting more and more uh, used up quicker and quicker. And in the end, we have to all do far, far more with far, far less, as Sarah Parkin said years ago here. Yep. You know, resources do matter. How on earth are we going to cope? How are we going to learn to re or even relearn to survive? It's not a matter of having, it's a matter of being. Okay, thank you. That's a, mm. that's a really good point. I'm glad you raised that. Mm. Any other questions? Yeah. There's, a, there's a lady with a stripy top and then a guy behind her with glasses. Hi. Um, I, when you mentioned the idea of the bigger question, monetary reform, maybe you don't want to talk about it, but I noticed that, that Giles smiled. And I was just wondering, you know, on your, the panelists' opinions on the idea that actually... It's not a good system that the banks do create the money and then control the money supply and your opinions on changing it. Thank you. Great, and the guy with the specs there. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if this is, this is the right discussion, but again, I, I, I agree. It's, the, it's not so much the flow of the money, it's the creation of the money that's the problem. And I'm just wondering if, if anyone's able to explain to me the benefits to humanity of bonds and guilts, uh, which I find quite interesting words. With the quantitative easing, money was created um, from nothing, and we should look at where that money first initially flowed to, because we all have to do something to create our money. But at that initial point, all they've had to do is create numbers on a machine. And it's interesting to me to see what they actually got for that money. Okay, three great questions. I, I, I've got lots to say, but I'll try and keep my trap shut. Um, do you, do you want to go first, after? Yeah, I'll try and cover them. Um, I totally agree with the point about resources, you know, global resources, but we've got um, certainly finite resources globally, and we need to be very constant and aware of that um, as we go through our banking system. And often a lot of people are, and certainly, certainly I, take, I take your point, absolutely. In terms of money, I, 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 I 
quite sympathetic to that view in terms of money creation. I mean, I often think maybe one of the best ways to get out of this, and people have talked about it, is, is, is rebasing our currency. Again, going back to the gold standard, um, albeit the UK's not got much gold left um, in the central bank um, coffers. But certainly, it's a, if you look back at history in terms of what's happened in terms of credit crises, depressions, and rebasing of money, it's a fair argument that we have now um, a quite an untoward monetary base that is created by the central banks and the banks every three or four months with the quantitative easing or whatever they do, as you say, punch um, um, some, some, press some keys and money comes into the system. And I do a lot of work with investment clients and a lot of them are really worried about this issue about the, the depreciation of sterling and the dollar eventually and are so concerned and, and actually f physically holding gold and investing just in that. And as, as we've known historically, gold serves as a, as a medium of exchange, as a currency as well. And it would not surprise me, albeit it's a small, small um, percentage uh, probability, I would say, that, that we have this massive currency blowout because of all of the money creation and we have to rebase to, to something akin to something much more stable. There's actually an interesting report just come out from New Economics Foundation about um, energy-backed money, which, which tries to address the environmental issue as well. Um, so have a look at that. Um, and anybody else want to respond to those three? I mean, in the first one, my view would be, I, I really don't think it would be unreasonable to have, for example, aspects such as sustainability as a, a one of the criteria in a lending proposition. Um, you know, every banker has to submit um, a lending proposition around a business. I don't see any reason why uh, aspects such as sustainability and other non-financial aspects shouldn't be in there. Um, and that would at least, from the lending perspective, help. Uh, in that di direction. Um, regarding the banks and the controlling the money supply, I, I just think there's, there's huge ironies in here. This is why I always find it quite funny. Because, you know, at, at the end of the day, banks are seen as these sort of, uh, you, know, you know, paragons of capitalism. But in many ways, at the same time, they're the greatest enemies of capitalism we've got. Like, capitalism has a way to deal with businesses that uh, run out of money, and that, that's liquidation. Because we haven't liquidated them, we have these problems, but yet we still allow organizations to experiment effectively with our future um, in a way, if it came to our health, if it came to any other area, you know, we would never say, okay, Tesco, experiment with some new foods, but we're quite happy for that to happen with uh, global uh, banking and finance systems. And, and that's where it's alarming that economists are the new masters of the universe, because, you know, they really are... Uh, people who have, from an academic perspective, different perspectives, and we'd expect to see a balance of those perspectives coming, coming through. And yet, uh, the way that individual economists' ideas are just suddenly adopted never ceases to uh, stagger me. But I shan't go on, uh, on, on that too long. So yes, I, I, I think there is a need for a reform. I mean, just picking up on the point about um, uh, resources. I mean, I think that is, is really important. I, I think that's a very good idea that can be part of any sort of lending proposal. But maybe one step further is that in annual reports of companies that that could be a measure that they would include themselves. Um, and then there's transparency about what, what uh, each company's emissions are. There, there, are proposed, there have been proposals actually to try and link what's called the capital um, reserve ratio, the capital adequacy ratio, to the sort of environmental or social benefit of the, of the loan, so mm -hmm. that you, you, you reduce how much capital a bank has to hold against a loan uh -huh. if it has greater social and environmental value. Um, and that's, I think, an interesting proposal. And also the idea of credit guidance and credit windows, which is actually um, something that states have practiced uh, all over the world at different times in history. Um, very strict sort of, you, you know, if banks are given the privilege of creating money out of nothing and charging interest on it, let's give them some guidance. Uh, you know, you, you can't just create money to speculate with. You have to create it for X sort of industry or that sort of industry. And I think those proposals yeah. have some, some um, 
you know, currency, so to speak. <laughs> but I, th I think that's maybe part of this social return on investment mm. as well that's being sort of trialled, I think, and trying to take root in, in measuring exactly that and the impact both socially and environmentally. We didn't res really respond to your question about QE and where that money disappeared mm. to. I mean, I think that's quite an interesting question. I think it was 375 billion um, in total so far. Um, and basically, it has it's, it's disappeared into banks' reserves. Um, and had we decided to create that much money and give it directly to every single person, I mean, it would have been something like 24,000 pounds each. Now, that would have really got the economy going again, wouldn't it? Because we, we would have spent it, and, and the banks would have been sitting on it. So, yeah, there's, there's QE for the public might be a, <laughs> a rallying cry. Um, cool. Have we got time for one more round of questions? Great. Anybody else want to comment or...? or... Okay, we've got one, two, three. So, yeah, let's go. I heard quite a nice analogy of the recession and, and, and the kind of bankers, banking industry. That it's like being at the, the seaside and the tide goes out and there's people in the sea without their trunks on. And this, this reveals, you know, that those who weren't prepared when they went in the sea in the first place. When the tide goes out again, do you feel that people will be prepared this time? I mean, will there be any kind of lasting change as a result of this crisis? Will the changes be enforced, uh, upheld, uh, adhered to, or are we just in an endless cycle of... Uh, what seems to be changed, but actually isn't. The, yeah, that's it. The guy with the pink shirt, he had his hand up, and then the girl at the front here. Um, I just would like someone to comment on the whole issue of money laundering. I've just been reading a report this morning on money laundering from Nigeria and the way in which oil money has disappeared into private um, accounts, assets, etc. in the West, in which British, uh, well, international banking, Western banks, have played a significant part. I just wonder if you'd like to comment on money laundering and whether it can really be stopped uh, to prevent assets from coming out of a country and not benefiting the country in which they actually started from. Thank you. And that, well, let's take one more question from this girl here at the front, and then we'll get your responses again. Hi, um, I just wanted to pick up on the thing that Giles said about we get the banks that we deserve. It sort of strikes me that probably most people are sort of unaware of most of the issues surrounding banking, kind of just, you know, like we expect that because it's always been like that, and we don't know that in other places it's different. Um, and I wonder if you have any ideas about how we could, I don't know, like educate the public more about the issues. Thanks. Should we start from your side this time, David? You, or actually, yeah, let's start with Charles okay. in the middle because we keep, I keep making you go first or Safta go first. So. <laughs> I, think, I think starting with the last point on uh, public education, I mean, w one of the things uh, we do as an organization is run uh, sessions in uh, schools on banking and finance and how it works. Um, frankly, uh, if it were me and I saw my entire country, indeed half the world, being bankrupted by banks, I'd be pretty damn sure I found out a lot about it, even if I wasn't in the sector. Uh, so I do think there is a personal responsibility there to, to do so when we see it as such a major threat. I mean, was it Churchill who said the greatest enemy of democracy was silence? Um, and uh, so, yes, there are some uh, schools education uh, projects and some you know, there's a lot of good internet sites out there, but people do, as ever with these things to an extent, have to undertake their own research to see what they are actually supporting and what they're buying into. Uh, in my view, that you, you need to do that with anywhere where you shop or buy. You need to really look closely at what am I actually buying here um, and what am I supporting. So I do think there's a degree of personal responsibility there, albeit there is a fair amount available out there. Um, moving on to money laundering, money laundering is of course a criminal offence and, and a lot of attempts are made internationally to stamp on it. It's very difficult to stamp on entirely. There's obviously endless rules and regulations in place. Every bank branch in the UK will pick up instances of what it suspects to be money laundering on a regular basis and yet many will still slip through the, the net. Um, 
can more be done? I think, interestingly, at government, governmental level, I think what you mentioned about Nigeria is interesting because a lot of these things are happening at the very top end of countries um, where money is being filtered off and filtered out of the country. And of course, some of that is exempt from uh, a lot of normal banking procedures. Uh, so, as I say, it's a criminal offence. Can we do anything about it? I'm, uh, I'm unsure. I think it's a very difficult one. You see shops opening up regularly, which have out overpriced articles, which are uh, money laundering uh, occupations. Um, you know, it goes on all around us, and it's quite difficult to stop, uh, frankly. And as regards the endless cycle that we find ourselves in, I'm afraid the cynic in me says, yes, we are, because who would I vote for if I wanted to change this? We need political input. None of the political parties that made it very clear are going to do anything real about this to change it. So unless we have fairly substantial political input and political change, yes, there's a lot of good work that can be done by individual organizations, but it is very small scale. It's not in the retail banking space. And in all honesty, the power lies with the government. They could take the big decisions to change some of this because of the scale of their shareholdings in the banks. If they decided to, you know, to, to push some, somewhere in this direction, they could take those decisions. Unfortunately, there is no political party, really, that reflects those views. Depressing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'll, I'll carry on. Yeah, certainly on the education, I th think that is uh, is really important. But then, uh, um, you know, we'd be very supportive of that. But you know, how, how do you fund that? How do you encourage that? Um, and you know, have qualifications or, or whatever that w w would would, uh, would would grow that side of things. In in terms of the the, the money uh, laundering. Um, yeah, I mean, as a bank employee, I'm just very aware at the sort of stringent uh, updating that we as employees have, have to go through uh, each year. So I, I can see that that has gradually uh, grown. And, and, you know, that is a responsibility of each, uh, each employee. Um, so look at it from, from, the, bank, uh, for, from the bank perspective. Um, in terms of... Is, are we going to change things? Um, uh, I'm an optimist, so I see people um, and the growth of the people and the conversations that you have with people. Uh, still a minority, but I think it's understand that the power we have as individuals on the choices that we make. Um, so as an optimist, I think it is small, but it will, will carry on. But it, as you see, it, it needs more. Uh, but the more people that are signing up, then the more you know, politicians and government need to take heed. On a technical point there, the FSA levy actually includes a payment for education around finance. But where that really goes is an interesting <laughs> question, which we shall pursue. <laughs> Did you want to say anything? Uh, very, yeah, very briefly. I mean, certainly, I would agree. I mean, education and awareness is, is certainly lacking and has been. Uh, I mean, a lot of people that I, I meet regularly just don't have a clue about finance, banking, the way it works. And I think the industry themselves and, and even maybe needs to work together with the education authorities or whatever to, to do that. And I think that that's something that should be progressed pretty substantially. In terms of money laundering, Nigeria. Um, it shouldn't be happening. I mean, there's meant to be strict criteria around a lot of these issues. We hear recently about Standard Chartered in Iran. Uh, they say it's tens of millions. The US um, government or, or, or authorities are saying it's running into billions. So we will we'll see about that one. But certainly money laundering, very serious offence. Um, shouldn't be happening. Um, but as we know, there's various ways of getting around this, where to ship it from. Because finance is so complex and it's computer driven, you can shift it to multiple other jurisdictions and, and get around that, so it's, it's, it but shouldn't certainly be happening. And in terms of the, the cycle, um, I think as human beings, we, we have uh, short memories. 
we, we tend to forget things pretty quickly. We get off, op, over optimistic the, as the old broom leave banking and the new generation come in who, who haven't experienced it or, or less so. Um, and and we, we have cyclicality in a lot of things and I think, don't think banking is any different. Unless we see a substantial, another blowout through sovereign debt crises in the Eurozone, etc., that may structurally change a lot of things. I, I, I can see us having this similar kind of conversation in, you know, 10, 15 years' time, and it won't be a credit bubble, it'll be something else, but it'll, it'll be linked to banking or some other industry of that effect, frankly. And let's not forget on that point, people tend to forget the collapse of the Scottish Cooperative Bank in the early mm. 80s, uh, oh, which is ethical. <laughs> I mean, that's something in a, in a sense that we can all do is, 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 is start, I mean, given that there is political space opening up because of these ongoing scandals, you know, mm. but the politicians are, are not quite kind of grasping the nettle yet. But if we, I mean, I noticed I organized a, a banking conference in April and pulled together a co coalition of NGOs to support that. And I think there was more willingness in the NGO sector to engage with this and try and understand how banking reform relates to their agenda than there has ever been. Um, so, I mean, if, you, if you're a member of, I don't know, Christian Aid or, or, or the World Development Movement or, or some trade union, you know, you can go to your, your civil society organization and say, what are you doing? What are you campaigning? What are you, what are you, what are you, what are you lobbying for on banking reform? And, and try to get them to engage with it as well. And, and I think that will help a little bit with the education side of things. Um, I, I'm sort of conscious that we're, we've run five minutes over time now. Um, so we need to stop. I'm really sorry um, to not have space for any more questions. Um, but thank you. I think we should give our panel a round of applause. And thank you for coming.